Hey, what's up? And welcome to this episode of EST, a podcast for established church leaders by established church leaders. My name is Josh King. My name is Sam, and I, I'm I'm really excited to introduce a, a special guest. This is well, this you don't is so sound great. excited. You sound you sound like you went straight to sleep there. Me? Yeah. No. You're like I'm slept... Sam, and I'm excited. Oh, come on. No, I I um. I got six hours of sleep last night, which is pretty typical for me. I, I should probably get a whole forty five minutes. <laughs> Just dropping. <laughs> is that what all, you got? All morning. I'm dropping you all morning. Introduce our guest. Yeah, we have Barnabas Piper on the show. So welcome to the show, Barnabas. Yeah, thanks for having me. I I, I felt the uh, the heart of enthusiasm, if not the expression of enthusiasm, <laughs> in your welcome. Yeah, that's what it was. Or, or should I should I say it like this? Pipe, baby, let's wander to and fro and suss some things out. Is, is does that see? Nobody, is that traumatic for you to hear that? Me. No, it's just nobody calls me that. That's that's a that's a unique thing between my podcast co-hosts Ted and Ronnie, and I live on the outside of that, looking in with mm. a, a vague sense of discomfort, like most of our listeners. <laughs> So, uh, co-host of the the Happy Rant. If you don't know that podcast, it's one of my favorites. You got to go listen to it so you can get it wherever you subscribe to podcasts. And I'm referencing Ted Cluck, um, uh, who I enjoy his writing as well. He's a very good writer. Um, but I've yet to figure out why he calls everyone baby. But you know, it, it just gets it's a thing. It's a it's it's a you know there are seminal points in our lives where where something externally influences us. And for Ted and Ronnie, it was the movie Swingers. Um, which is okay. a particularly Gen X cultural uh, time capsule that influenced them greatly at one point. And there's this whole scene where the guy is just, I think it's Vince Vaughn's character is repeating the phrase, you're so money, baby. And they just sort of absorbed it and, hmm. uh, and it became their thing. I, however, do not have any affinity for swingers. So again, <laughs> not my thing. All right. Well, um, I'll try to refrain from from using cluck isms. That's probably <laughs> I got to be careful saying that. Yeah. Who's our Who's our sponsor today? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, well, our sponsor is who has always sponsored the show, at least for the last several months, and we are very, very grateful to Church Teams. So, if you've been listening to this, you've you've heard us talk about Church Teams. Love this company and what they provide for churches. Um, they take all of your software needs and put them under one umbrella. So you've got membership, check-in, email, text marketing, uh, online giving, scheduling, groups, process management, even giving. They do it all. And uh, one of the things I love about church teams is you know, a lot of you are part of an established church and your budgets are, well, they're limited. You don't have an unlimited amount of funds. Mm -hmm. They offer value without compromise. This is world-class technology at a price that any church can afford. They have plans starting at $37 a month uh, for, under, for churches under 200 people. Uh, you can add text to church for 10 bucks a month, online giving for $20 a month. So here's the thing. And, and they, they want to do you well, uh, listeners. And so they're offering to you, our listeners, just for you, um, two months free. And kind of a free little mini consult. So est.church, that's where you can go to get this offer. Go to est.church, fill out the form. They'll work with you. Uh, you won't regret this. So thank you, church teams, for sponsoring the show. Thank you more than just sponsoring the show for actually providing a valuable service to churches at a price that any church can afford. So est.church, go check it out. Yep, very, very good uh, sponsor there. We're going to talk about deacons. That's Indeed. It. What are we going to say? What now? do you use them for? Deacons? You want to? <laughs> well, you could, well uh, they are I'm sure. They're. Did you say they're biblical? They're biblical. Yeah. Well, yes, yes, they are. Um, do you, and and sometimes you want to go Old Testament, Old Testament on them, right? <laughs> I have heard. Yes. <laughs> so uh, all of us kind of have a different structure with our deacons. So let's mm -hmm. first recognize some polity issues. Uh, we're more on the practical church leadership side here at EST, but there are some polity issues. So if you're listening to this, uh, likely you kind of have some differences with us. We understand that. Um, but I think my, my personal take, every church should have deacons. And But the question is, 
what do you use them for? So, uh, Josh, why don't you walk us through kind of your structure, and then I'd like to hear from Barnabas on this. Hmm. Well, first, I'm curious. I know sort of how Baptists do it, and I know how Presby's do it. Uh, like, how do Methodists? I never hear about them with deacons and stuff. What about like I'm not, Method- I'm not Methodist. I but don't you know, know stuff. You know things. I thought you would know this. Do you know Barnabas? I I don't know, and I I don't. I mean, I know relatively little about the Methodist uh, kind of church polity Polity. structure other than Mm. there's a, there's generally a rotation of ministers. And so it's possible. Mm -hmm. I I think they do have deacons, but I think there's probably some fluidity in how they use them. But yeah, I I don't know in depth. I know that Mm. like in, in the high church. um, So like in the Anglican church, I'm thinking Protestant, not Catholic, the, the deacons there, it's a, it's an ordained position, you know, as opposed to, you know, in the Baptist world, the, the lower church world, if you will, it's not ordained. It's more just a, it's a maybe there's a vote, maybe there's not, whatever. It's a it's a it's a committee kind of thing. But for them, it's mm. uh, like in the Anglican Church, it's serving you know ordained, serving communion. There's a, there are particular sort of um, liturgical roles that they play that again mm-hmm. would be different than your church or mine, which we're non denominational but kind of Presbyterian leaning in our structure. Mm. All right. Well, at our at second. Our deacons are service oriented. We are a staff led church. Then we have committees that serve in a number of ways, largely directional and um, decision bodies. And then the deacons are service oriented. Like some of the larger things that they accomplish are hospital care and care for the widows. So it's a pretty standard mid to large size Baptist church model as far as our deacons go. Yeah, and our structure is um, we call the husband and the wife together, and I guess that's fairly common, but um, it's kind of a a thing where we expect our deacons and their wives to to serve together. It's kind of a family thing, mm. um, and our our deacons um, are ordained. We walk through an ordination process with them. Um, there's some very specific things that we have in place for a deacon uh, to be ordained. Um, and they are definitely more on the servant leadership side of things than uh, making operational decisions in the church. And on Baptist world, you you really got to make that distinction, right? There's you know a certain vein where deacons have more oversight of how the church runs, and then there's churches like ours where they're there to be a support for. The operations mm. of the church. We have a committee structure at West Bradenton. Um, our committees are the ones that tend to make more of the operational decisions, particularly around facilities and finances, um, personnel things, and things like that. The personnel committee helps me hire and fire people. Hopefully, I don't have to fire people, but hire people. Um, now we have deacons that serve on those committees. We expect our deacons to serve in various areas of the church. So it's kind of like our deacons are our key leaders, but they're not key leaders because they're deacons. Um, they're kind of selected as a deacon because they're already leading in certain areas. So uh, we do expect our deacons to serve. Uh, we've got deacons that serve every ministry from worship and children's and students to some of the operational stuff. Uh, but the deacon body itself, um, one of the things that I do with my deacons is that I ask them to be accountability for me. So they have a window into my world. Um, particularly, I've got three or four deacons in particular that are really great accountability partners. And I know when you say that phrase, you kind of have to like, what do you mean by that? But they they have freedom into my life just about, well, in any part of my life. Um, and I lean on them to, you know, hold me accountable spiritually. Um, and it's been a very good arrangement. I've asked them to do that. That was not something they were doing before I arrived at West Bradenton. But I've got a very healthy group of deacons and their wives, and they all serve together. Just had a big get together at my house and uh, and had a good time. So I guess we all do have a have a little bit different structure. Um, Barnabas, walk me through like some of the things that you uh, that you like about what what uh, deacons do at your church at Emmanuel. Yeah, it's uh, we're in an interesting place with that right now, just because of <clears throat> the the church growth and sort of the different iterations we've been in over the years. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, Manuel's about 15 years old, so we I think we you know we are established, but we're still on the sort of the younger end of the spectrum. We don't have a long history of this is how we've always done things. Um, we're an elder rule church, so pastors and elders 
are the, the decision makers. Those people are voted, uh, voted on by the congregation. Deacons also are voted on by the congregation. So self-nominated and then voted on by the congregation. And the, the role of deacon has, has been a couple different things over the years in the, in the past, especially when the church was small, deacons functioned kind of like unpaid staff members. So they might be the big, the deacons of finance, the deacons of facilities, those kinds of things. And to some degree, they still do that. But that really depends on the the particular, which particular deacons are available. So like our, our, uh, our treasurer is a deacon and she is, she's a, she's a retired banker and an absolutely skilled financial person. And so if she stepped off the deacon board, we would we would do something very different with finance, I'm sure. But uh, so most mostly our deacons oversee benevolence, um, you know. So in terms of meeting the financial needs, caring for the you know congregation uh, members of the congregation in need, they oversee facility care, things like that, making sure the building is is set up. But again, that's specific to need because right now we are in a leased space. And so we have we have sort of space limitations. So it doesn't make sense for us to have a full time facilities person. So the deacons kind of oversee that. Um, and and then they do a fair amount of what you might call what you might call hospitality, meaning, you know, we're in Nashville. And uh, and so there's just a ton of new people coming to town. And so we will get requests. Hey, I'm new to the church. Um do you know anybody hiring for jobs? Those kinds of things. A lot of those kinds of requests. So the, the connection making kind of stuff runs through deacons. So it, it's, hmm. it's that version of hospitality. Um, but we're we're on the front end of of kind of rethinking the specificity of deacon roles to serve our congregation better. And so I, where it's likely to go in the in the coming months is actually having lead deacons who are overseeing teams of people who are doing our everything from our, our greeters to our parking ministry, to our benevolence, to just there are these different categories with a lead deacon overseeing a team of volunteers um, and, and functioning that way. So it's, like I said, we've, we've sort of had these different iterations. Similarly to you guys, it is very much the, the sort of the hands and feet of Jesus, if you will. You know, if the pastors and elders are sort of the the decision makers, the teachers, the mouthpiece, the deacons are doing a lot of the, the boots on the ground work of caring for people in, in practical ways. Hmm. All right, let me throw this question out there. Josh, should what? deacons rotate or not? Should hmm. you have a deacon? Because I know a lot of churches do this. They have, a, they have a like a three-year rotation. Should you do that or not? Yeah, I, I don't I don't see any reason to do that. I think that in some cases I could see that argument being made because like if I, I was on staff at a church in Texas, I wasn't the pastor. And I remember he liked that the pastor at the time, he liked that kind of thing because his argument was if he ever got a bad one in there, he only had three years to deal with them and then they would rotate. Yeah, out. it's a good but, way to avoid church discipline. Yes. Yeah. So I, <laughs> but I, I kind of, I don't see the reason for it. I don't like. I don't think this. I don't like that with elders. I don't like that with deacons. Um, so I would say no. I, I'm All not right, sure why you would Ro rotate deacons or not. Uh, yeah, I'm in favor of rotating deacons. I'm. I, I take a different position than Josh on this one, and 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 elders for that matter. Um, just simply, I think the primary reason is not to pro. I mean, there there is a, a benefit in protecting yourself from entrenched you know, wh whoever's a pain in the butt. But the primary benefit is that a good deacon is wearing themselves out. They are, they're serving like crazy. And so to say, do this for three years and then take a year off or whatever your term is, could be three, could be four, could be five. I think fewer than three and you just have so much turnover, it's counterproductive, mm. you know, more than four or five. And what's the point of rotating at that point? Like your whole church has turned over in six years. So you know, what, why do that? But it's, it's a, it allows for refreshment. It allows for, um, for them to, to be served every several years, um, to take a step back. And I think, so I think there's a real benefit. I think the same is true on the elder side and on that side, uh, protecting yourself from entrenched leadership is a real thing. If, if you are in a structure like we are, that's elder rule, 
if you have an elder who's very agenda driven now, right now our church is blessed with, you know, I think we have 12 or 13 elders, really godly, humble men. Um, and, and very unified, but should, if there was somebody who wasn't in outright, you know, rebellious sin, but was a real pain and was just contentious and difficult and whatever, uh, rotation keeps that person from, from being that way endlessly. And if you've been around elder churches that have sort of basically lifetime tenures, man, that can go sour because because removing somebody, removing an elder is a really big deal. Like that's, it's sort of cataclysmic for a church. And so having those seams where if there's somebody who shouldn't be a deacon or an elder and you can off, you can offboard them without causing controversy, that's, mm -hmm. that's good for the whole church. But the, but the biggest benefit is rest. Uh, it's sort of kind of a, if you will, a Sabbath rhythm for leadership or for service in the church. So if you sign up to be a deacon at Emmanuel, um, basically you're being told, we know we're going to burn you out, um, <laughs> so you're only going to do this for three years. Um, now, now, I do have a legitimate question if, around if you this. Sign up to be, if you sign up to be a deacon at Emmanuel, you are basically saying, I, I am the type of person who who's throwing myself into this. Like, we we don't have lazy deacons. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's just it because there, there's just an understanding of this is. This is the sort of this is the fast lane of service. So we we run in the red, not we don't try to burn them out. There's just there's just always need, you know, in a, in a healthy church, there's always need because you're you're constantly seeking to to care for people. So, yeah, there's and 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 if somebody steps off mid term, you know, they, they have a three or four year term, if they if partway through they say, you know, my family circumstances have changed. My health has changed, whatever I need to step off. That's there's, there's no, there's no shame in that. That's not a, you know, we're not like get out of here, quitter. It's more just good. Now we have the opportunity to serve you in your time of need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like no, and it make, I it makes sense. And I got a follow-up question here. Um, with, with where your church is in its life cycle, do you think that's mm -hmm. part of it? Because you're, you're in that transition phase between church plant and established church. So, you know, do you think that you're – because we don't utilize our deacons like that. Ours are – once you're a deacon, you're always a deacon. But half of the ministry of a deacon at our church, literally half, is prayer. Like we have our deacon meetings where we just pray, and then they help me at the end of the service by praying with people. So I'd, I'd say – yeah, I'd say a good half of the ministry of West Bradenton Deacons is prayer along with the other things that they're doing. But again, How many deacons you know, do we have? got – um, Deacons and wives together, about 50-ish. Um, okay. You know, forty to fifty. Um, so, uh, but we were started in the nineteen fifties. So we've had, right. you know, decades of entrenchment with how we do things, tweaked it along the way, and we've changed things since I've been here. But we're an established church. We have established patterns. You're in a church that still has that church plant energy like we, we you know we're setting up and tearing down every week if I, if I heard you right if you said you're in least space no we're we're not setting up and tearing down it's just that we we don't have the we don't have the the owned footprint where it, if we owned 80,000 square feet of building space with you know with all the classrooms with whatever we would it would make sense probably to hire make, you know a, a facilities person and they may have volunteers they may have part timers whatever as it stands we have a portion of that building, which, which is exclusively ours. We don't have to set up and tear down, but the facilities wouldn't, it doesn't make sense where we are financially or space wise to do that. And so the deacons take ownership of that, uh, of that mm. piece of it. So it, it is sort of a, it's sort of a weird in between hybrid where we are established. Like we've been in the same building for eight years, but we will probably only be here another two to three years based on our lease and based on our landlord saying we would like to have that space back. So now we're in the, also in the midst of a, a building campaign, which is everybody's favorite thing. Um, and so, yeah, so our, our deacons are are carrying kind of a, a heavy load on that front. We we also have, um, I mean, we on a, on a Sunday, we probably have 900-ish people, including kids. So we're, I mean, by Nashville standards, that's a mid-sized church. By some places, it's tiny. And by if you live in the Northeast, that's you, a mega church. So that's... You'd be the, the second largest church in our region. If, um, right. if, if you were in our area. 
So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, what, however you view 900 people, we are not a massive church, but neither are we tiny. And I think we have six or eight deacons. So it's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a very different structure. Now we, we would like more, but also, like I said, we're moving towards this model where six or eight might be the right number because they're lead deacons and each of them is then overseeing volunteers in, in these various mm. areas of ministry. Um, and then I know of churches like I think uh, I think John MacArthur's church is like this. I don't know uh, how his name is received here, but a very established church. So he at least fits the brand. Um, <laughs> they basically we'll let our listeners determine that one. Yeah. Uh, and this is a morally neutral statement. So this is this is neither here nor there. Um, I believe that they view basically anybody who's a committed volunteer a, as a deacon, you know, they're because they're doing service work in the church. So they have something like 2000 deacons you know, and, uh, which again, that you talked earlier, like this, we're not, we're not trying to get into the theology of this and, and, and flesh that out, but that is a, that's, that's based on a particular biblical interpretation of deacon as well as a, just, there's a pragmatism to it in terms of how they, how they organize it. That to me, that, I think that would actually deter people in our context. If we said, if you serve here, you're a deacon, because most people would be like, no, no, I'm a greeter. Uh, I do not want to be right. a deacon. That's that's mm-hmm. a that's a high bar. I would like to say hi to people and smile at them and make them feel welcome. <laughs> that's what I'm here to do. <laughs> yeah, I can I can I can just hear certain listeners, you know, just saying, "Lord, please, no, don't give me two thousand deacons. Please, don't don't do that." <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, somebody's shaking in the corner, sucking their thumb right now when they hear that. Mm-hmm. So let's go. Let, let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. A, a lot of our listeners are at small churches, and I know my first church had seven people. And was it six? I can never remember. I think it was six or seven. And it was one deacon and his name is Herbie and he had more tattoos than teeth. Um, so what do you do? And by the way, he kept that church running. So kudos to, to Herbie. Um, what do you do if you've got like 30, 40 people, one deacon, and the church really has no concept of what a deacon really is? Like, I've been there. What? What would you guys say, Josh? What would you say to that person? Which person am I talking to? The the new like, pastor of a church of thirty people that has one deacon, and the church really doesn't know what to do with deacons or have any concept of what deacons are. Man, I, I would just go back. So scripturally, deacons, um, sort of the genesis of it. I don't think it's exactly a one to one, but the genesis is this idea that the deacons are devoted to work, so that the elders, the pastors, can you know, preach and teach and pray. And so they can lead. And so I I usually try to explain it like there's authority and there's responsibility. Deacons carry out a lot of responsibilities. In my previous church, what I did, and I had been there quite a few years, I just took out a piece of paper and I wrote down all the stuff that is taking my time, all the, and it, and it just, the stuff that was a burden to me. And some of it was good things like preaching and prayer and those kind of things. They, they made the list obviously, but then there were other just items that I didn't have to do. And so I walked into the the room where our deacons were and I said, here's the list of things that are pulling me away from the things I'm supposed to be doing. Do y'all want to do any of these? And they took them all and they kind of divided them out and they became leaders in those ministries. We had one guy of everything that, um, everything that grows on our campus, you know? And so if it was a tree, if it was grass, if it, you know, anything like that, he took care of all of that. I didn't have to worry about it. We had another guy who was deacon of everything you can get in. And so if it was a building or a bus or anything, he just, he took care of all of that stuff. We had one that took care of security and they just, they took on these burdens. We were a smaller staff church. We didn't have a a large staff. And so they just took on these burdens and ran with them. I found that to be two sides that were really helpful. One was it was very clear that's how this helps our church. The other side was a lot of times, especially in your rural churches and in our, you know, our Baptist churches tend to be in the rural areas. Your deacons are these kind of, um, they're usually quiet and they're like, they're, they're, they're masculine and they're, they're man's men. Right. And they're just, they don't feel comfortable if their only task is to ever just go visit widows and to sit with this widow and just kind of like encourage her. That's just not their strength. And so there were a few that wanted to do that. There were a few that wanted to do hospital care, but the other ones wanted to 
make sure the grass was cut and train people to have security and stuff. So I found that when you free them to do the things they want to do. So if I was going into a new church, that's kind of how I would approach it again is just say, these guys help so that I can pastor. They help in ways that I don't have to do uh, as a pastor. So I would just make a list and then start saying which ones Herb wants to do. And then he can do those and we'll find other guys to take care of the other stuff. Yeah, that, that's good stuff. Barnabas, any any additional thoughts there? Well, yeah, I, I think I, in principle, I totally agree with with Josh. I think the number, you know, if it's a small church, you're talking like basically brand new church plant, 40, 50 people. That's an all hands on deck scenario. Like, I don't even know that I would bring deacons up. I think the deacons yeah. would rise to the, like, they would rise to the role because basically what you tell a church like that, because that probably is a set up and tear down situation. That probably is a like, you, how many programs are you running if you have 40 people? Like you're trying to get somebody to watch the kids so you can do one service a week and then maybe you're meeting in two or three homes or whatever. Like those, those No, but, but you know you've thing. got 18 committees at that church, right? Well, well not, not, He's not in about my plan. church polity. Not in your so, church. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 18... That means there's a lot of one person committees or one person is on all 18 of those committees. I'm not sure how that works, but uh, well, I am sure that doesn't work. Um, So but I think I think what I would want to do is basically impress upon people the I would start with, you know, that the the body of Christ, family of God metaphor slash image that's that's used in the New Testament is basically like. You know, it, this only works if we all pitch in. Like, there's a reason why in it. If you if you're a family with with a large number of kids, like everybody does something. You know, there's everybody does chores. Everybody cleans up their own room. Everybody, you know, if you're going on a road trip in your big 15 passenger van, everybody's carrying their own backpack out there. That kind of stuff. That's kind of the image there. And then what happens over time is that you realize that three or four of these people are the ones who are seeking out more opportunities to care. They're getting there earlier to set up. They're, they're setting the bar for others in terms of service. And you can go to them and say, you're actually doing the work of a deacon. So the, the deacons can then be formed out of the what the Lord is doing through people. And then I would go to where, to where Josh was describing, I think, which is, Yeah, the work of the deacon is to take the stuff off of the pastor slash elders plate so that so that the the work of the word can be emphasized, you know, whether that's individual work of the word, counseling, uh, hospital visits, whatever, or particularly the the preaching and prayer aspects of things. But, yeah, I think I would I would just sort of get all hands on deck and then see which three or four or five sets of hands Mm -hmm. show themselves as deacon types. Because they're just they're always at the front of the the line to care, serve, be trustworthy, you know, show up, show up when needed, that kind of thing. Right. You know, I've got this enduring image in my brain of Herbie. And I came to church for a work day. It was on a Saturday. He was he always beat me to church. I was never gonna get there. I never I don't know what time he got to church, but you know, it was always way early. And I had to drive two hours one way to get there. It was a rural church. I lived in the city. And um, I've got this enduring image of him on the second floor. There's just a small area. It's like a, basically, basically a one-room church, but it had a stairway in the back, and it went up to this small room. I guess that's where they did Sunday school back in the day. Um, and it was just full of stuff, just so much stuff. And he wanted to do a church cleanup, which was great. We needed it. And I've just got this enduring image of him, of him throwing out hundreds of nasty old choir robes into this giant bonfire below him. And and I'm, I'm just thinking he's going – He's going to burn the church down because uh, these things lit up like they were kindling. All right. I mean, it was it, – and as soon as they touched so those that, flames, it was a lot like of, they There was exploded. a lot of hairspray on those. You know there was, <laughs> was a lot something. of hairspray on those. It was, it was yeah. something. I just – and so when, when it's like, what do deacons do? That's what I think of. I think of Herbie on the second floor of Union Band Baptist Church in Howardstown, Kentucky, throwing out all of these choir robes into this into this giant bonfire. Um, all right, Barnabas, thanks for joining the show, Josh. Thank you, too. But you, you're my regular yeah. co-host. And, you, you got uh, the same Barnabas, enthusiasm I did when I showed up. <laughs> <laughs> now, Barnabas has got a book. I want to tell you about his new book, Belong, Loving Your Church by Reflecting Christ to One Another. Um, Barnabas, give me like the one minute version of what this book is about. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's a book for church goers. So it's I mean, it, it'd be fine for like a, ch- a church leadership team to go through specifically the aspects of church culture. But the whole premise of it is what does it mean to genuinely find belonging in the church? Um, we have at Emmanuel, we have so many new people who show up, especially being in Nashville. It's a very transient city. And the the common sort of ache in their hearts is finding a place to genuinely belong. And so it's looking at God's design for the church as as the, the body, the family, the home. It's it's looking at what does it mean to actually belong, which means living in the design God has for us as Christians. There's no such thing as, as a healthy Christian who's isolated from the local church. And and then it's uh, and then it's also trying to answer hard questions like uh, if I have been hurt by a church, if I've been disappointed, if I haven't been in church in years what does it look like? How do I overcome those things? So it's a short book. It's maybe a hundred ish pages. Um, so it's, and so it's the kind of thing that I would hope churches could, could put in the hands of, uh, people considering membership or guests, the kind of thing that just says, Hey, we want to be the kind of church where you find this. We would love to put this in your hands, give it to you, talk through it with you. Uh, it could be good for small groups, just thinking about being a kind of a missional welcoming environment, that kind of thing. All right. Well, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to, we are going to do something really nice for our listeners with your book. Um, we're going to pair this book with my dad's new book, I Am a Christian. Um, so you, my dad's Tom Rainer, and he's written a few books and sold a few books. Um, if you don't know him, that's fine, but most people want to buy his books. So we're going to take Barnabas's book, Belong. We're going to pair it with, I am a Christian, which like really two good books go right together. And if you sign up for a gold membership at Church Answers, we will mail these books to you. So for free. Um, so here's how it works. Go to churchanswers.com slash join. Sign up for the gold membership, which has got all sorts of great tools for your church. You probably need to get it anyway. So churchanswers.com slash join. Email me at sam at churchanswers.com. One, I'd like to just thank you for joining Church Answers, being a gold member. And then what I will do is I'll get your address, or you can just send me your address, and I will have my team mail you Barnabas's book, Belong, and Tom Rainer's new book, I Am a Christian. We'll send you both of those for free if you sign up for a gold membership at Church Answers. So the way you do that is churchanswers.com slash join, and then email me personally, sam at churchanswers.com. We'll get you those books. Uh, Barnabas, I hope people take us up on this offer because your books yeah, are really very kind. good. I book. appreciate and, you doing that. Well, we'd like to get it into our listeners' hands. So um, th- th- now you get two books, a gold membership, you know, all for a very reasonable price. And email churchanswers.com slash join. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know that anyone really cares about that, but I've got to I've got to actually forward it to my team so that they can take care of the you know the purchasing process and get it. And I'm sure they're going to love that I did this on the on the show. Um, they're going to be like, really, you did another giveaway and you're making us mail these books. But but in all reality, it's a great book. Get we want our to list. Do it. There, oh, there you go. Yes, hmm. yes, I love that. Well, thanks again, guys, for tuning in. Josh, sign us out, bro. Man, thanks so much for listening. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast, and we will check you next week. 